No, let's start. Right, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to join me while I, I give this presentation. It's on modern freight wagons. The focus will be the if threat to, um, because they're currently under build by WH Davis at the moment. Just want to hide this window so I can. So presentation content, I'll give an introduction about myself, um, WH Davis as a company, um, WH Davis's history of rail projects, and then I'll talk a bit about freight and intermodal, um, sort of the evolution into Ecofrat 1, which was the predecessor to Ecofrat 2, which we built for our customer, VTG. I'll talk about the objectives that were set, as part of the project. Um, then the areas I want to cover is the build, design, and the approvals, um, where it's all with a, an overview. On the design side, um, WH Davis were responsible for the wagon, the structure, and the brake system mainly. So we did the full FEA for the structure um, and the setting out of the brake system and the calculations. For the approvals, it would just be an overview of the approach taken. Um, and then at the end, there will be questions and answers session, as Louise has mentioned. <clears throat> so a bit about me. Um, currently, the engineer manager of WH Davis. I've been in engineering for 22 years currently. The first 10 years were various disciplines. I worked as a structural detailer, so that was civils, a uh, process engineer. So that was manufacturing engineering. Um, towards the end of that, I was a draftsman. But I was studying at the engine mechanical engineering part time. Um, that took seven years, and I graduated in 2010. 2010s also when I started at WH Davis as a design engineer. Um, within five years from design engineer, I'd become design engineering team leader. Um, then after that, four years. Well, four years ago now, I became the engineering manager. Um, I'm currently responsible for all design and engineering activities at WH Davis, including compliance. Um, I'm currently an associate member of the IMECE and I'm working towards chartered. <clears throat> so just a bit of history about WH Davis. So the language Junction Depot, which is our current site now, was opened by the Lancashire, Derbyshire and East Coast Railway in the 19th century. WH Davis as a company was formed in 1908 by the Doncaster station master, William Henry Davis, and it was to build wooden bodied mineral wagons. Pre and post-war, WH Davis developed a UK network of depots for general repair of wagons. Uh, numerous depots were scattered all over the country, including London in the north and the south. In the 1960s, um, heavily involved in engineering work, so engineering and erection of hoppers, silos, dockside cranes, and general engineering projects, along with rail wagon modifications. In the 1970s, um, I had quite a good order for design and manufacture of rail hopper wagons, and we also started manufacturing of those containers. In the 1980s, um, engineering and fabrication of containers, containers continued, and we had over 200 types of design approvals for containers, ranging from refrigerated, um, special like big screens, special packing containers, um, in the 1990s, started building road, road trailer and dockside equipment that was added to the portfolio, along with production facilities, purpose built for refrigerated containers, and that was for major blue chip and leasing companies. Um, unfortunately, the container work did start to die down. Um, China 
in the Far East, they were building containers in high volumes. Um, they couldn't compete with the price competitively. But in the 2000s, we did continue um, refurbishing containers and we opened up a depot in Middlesbrough and Grangemouth for that purpose. Uh, notably, 2006, um, Davis Wagon Services were formed, which is one of our sister companies. Now, they deal with maintenance for freight wagons. 2007, we awarded our first um, low level waste repository nuclear container framework. And to this day, we are currently still building containers for them. And we have production orders going through now. So 2010 is when I joined the business. So the next bit of work I'm more familiar with because I was involved in. So we've managed and produced a number of high profile projects uh, for various customers. So we produced, the, actually designed based on an existing design, but with improvements, the FNAD wagons that you can see on your left for the Nuclear Decommissioning Agency. Um, it was an existing design, but it used to have a skin on it, um, which would be washed down. We removed the skin, um, put a special paint on it that could take the detergents used for the wash down. We improved the canopy mechanism and it was fitted with newer, more modern bogies for the brake equipment. Next one in the middle is a WH Davis design. It's the IDA low liner wagon. We built 76 of these. So the Got a 720 millimeter deck height, which allows for the conveyance of nine foot six inch high cube containers without restrictions on WA. To the right, we have the IIA Drax biomass wagons. Um, we built 225 of these. It was a Lloyd's register design. Um, really good contract. So it's quite a revolutionary box, and there was a lot of work that went into it. So it was a satisfying build to see it go from design through to on our side it was fully built. So that's just an example of some of the new build projects that we've worked on. The other work that we do, um, and we have done it over the years previous to me joining, is repurposing projects. Now, after the Drax project, the new build wagons, we had a bit of a lull where there was um, a gap in orders. And that gap was filled by repurposing projects. The first one that we did was taking a HYA or an IIA three door um, coal hopper wagon and we converted it to a two door um, aggregate wagon. We do this by taking out the middle section, removing one pair of doors and joining it back together. So we start off with a wagon length of 18.4 meters. We reduce the length down to 14.9 meters. The load capacity goes from 90 meter cubed to 63 meter cubed. So we've got a 30% reduction in volume. The tire weight goes from 27 ton to 24 and a half ton. So a 9.3% decrease in tire weight. The payload goes from 74.6 ton to 77.1 ton. So slightly by 3%, we increase the payload. Now, the advantage of this is because aggregates are more dense product, they can get more payload per train length because the wagon's shorted and they're utilizing the volume better, as opposed to pulling them with the original wagon, um, which was being done because the coal market dropped out. So there's a lot of redundant coal hopper wagons sat about. The wagons you can see on the screen, they're again coal hopper wagons, but these are. HHA wagons. If you look at the top right picture, that is taking the four door hopper wagon and turning it into a two door hopper wagon for the purpose of conveying aggregate product. The bottom right hand picture, what we've done on this one is we've retained the bogies, the draw gear, the brake equipment, and we've made a new box. So we've given it a new unique lease of life with the original equipment as a box wagon. So we've done various other ones. We did the coil carrier to a box, um, but in total, in the time I've been with WH Davis, we've now gathered new lease alive to 600 old vehicles by repurposing them.
Um, here's just an example of some of the customers we've had over the years. So Network Rail, currently have two projects on with them. Freightliner, GE Capital as it was. Um, the picture in the bottom left is what we did for them. It, we manufactured 26 of those scrap wagons. GB Rail Freight, two acts. And then bottom line is customers we've had who are related to the nuclear industry or containers. So we've had quite widespread of customers over the years. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to freight and intermodal, um, just to set the scene a little bit. So freight has advantages um, over hauling by road. So reliability and speed is one. Um, freight operating com companies can offer 97% reliability on premium services for retailers. And in general, freight can match for better road freight reliability. It's cost effective, um, especially with volume. It has environmental benefits. Rail freight reduces CO2 emissions by up to 76% compared to road. Improved air quality, which is always good. Rail produces up to 10 times less small particulate matter than road haulage and as much as 15 times less nitrogen oxide for the equivalent mass fall. Reduced congestion and better safety. So for each freight train, it removes up to 76 lorries from the roads, resulting in 1.6 billion fewer HGV kilometers every year. Regional growth is supported. A um, good example of that is near me, um, near East Midlands, where they've opened up the new freight terminal. And per billion on the right, you've got a graph courtesy of the ORR's website. And as you can see, it splits freight move in billion net ton kilometers into the type. And the one that's highest in each occasion is domestic intermodal. So intermodal is an important part of freight and a good market. So some intermodal wagons, um, historically in pre fret one. So on the left, you've got the FGA twin deck wagons. It's first domestic intermodal, intermodal wagon. It was introduced in the mid sixties with VR Freightliner services. In the middle, um, typical FEA twin 60 foot deck wagon. On the end, um, rather than a twin, this is a single. So it's a KFA single 60 foot deck wagon. There's various other single, twin, triple and low deck um, container wagons. There's just an example of a few. All right, so historically there's been known issues or areas of improvement for um, container wagons. The FGA twin deck wagons, sorry, what you can get is empty 20 foot slots on 60 foot flats caused by the imbalance of 20 foot to 40 foot boxes, which creates gaps. <laughs> um, in an ATSLU standard length unit, so 512 meter long train, a typical 60 foot wagon will carry 28 40 foot boxes. Now, over the length of the train, um, this leaves quite a lot of redundant space. The issues with having spaces on wagons or gaps, whether it be between containers or books and draw gear, is that it creates turbulence and that contributes to aerodynamic losses. So, there's been experiments in this and it's been reported that a reduction of about 10% in drag coefficient is the gap between hub cars is reduced from 1.87 meters to 0.65. So it does have a big effect on the aerodynamic performance of the wagons. A better aerodynamic performance will give better fuel efficiency, reducing costs for the operators. But also importantly, especially on the empty slots, empty spaces will equate to lost revenue. So our customer who we built the Ecofret 2s for, um, they built the Ecofret 1. 
So they had some advantages of building the Ecofret 1. That's why they went ahead with the project. So the Ecofret 1 can be arranged in either a twin or triple platform configuration. And um, with the right mixture of triples and twins, it's possible to carry 37, 40 foot boxes in a 80 standard length unit, unit, unit long train. If you compare to that to the wagon on the previous slide, it's a 32% improvement over a train of traditional 60 foot deck wagon, which would carry 28. The other thing, the Ecofret also eliminates the empty 20 foot slots on some 60 foot flats caused by the imbalance of 20 foot to 40 foot boxes, it's a 40 foot wagon. <clears throat> so based on the improvements they've made on the Ecofret 1, BTG were looking to improve on this again. So there was three main objectives as part of the project. They needed a bogey that was compliant with GMR P2141 um, as a result of Gloucester where the track was out of spec and um, a wagon derailed. GMR T2141, which is about dynamics and ride, it was updated with a clause to demonstrate that vehicles are not susceptible to the element due to cyclic top track features. The Ecofret 1, the bogies were a traditional URC sense pivot arrangement, um, sprung primary suspension and the side bear arrangement, which can be more susceptible to cyclic top. BTG had been in talks with Axiom Rail Freight, who were developing a new TF20 bogey. Now, if you look at the bottom of your screen on the left hand side, that is the TF20 bogey. It was based upon the TF25, um, which had been around for quite a few years, but this was being targeted specifically for container wagons because the deck height's got to be achieved. The TF family of bogies, as you can see in the picture, as well as having a primary suspension, they've got vertical dampers. So these bogies are less susceptible to cyclic top. Um, second objective, the Ecofret 1, the outer wagons, they could only carry a 40 foot container. So VTG wanted to put a double outrigger arrangement on so it could carry two 20 foot boxes. Advantages of this is it gives them increased carrying options for the different container types. And then the third objective, they wanted a new brake system. Um, and they specified the manufacturer being DACAV. So with those requirements in mind, VTG set up a project team. So the design of the wagon body was an associated items apart from the bogey is WH Davis. The build is WH Davis for the wagon body. The design and build of the bogey is Axiom Rail Freight, um, who, as I said, they were developing a prototype bogey. Brake equipment supplier, DACO. On the approval side, BTG were the project entity, so they had overall responsibility for the approval of the wagon. They subcontracted Belper Rail to manage the approvals, so that involved making the clause by clauses, gathering all the evidence, pulling it together, and then that would be submitted to Aegis, who under the current um, regulations, it was a TSI, they were acting as the NOBO, EBO, and ASBO. And then additionally, we had Fishbone Associates and Derby. They were involved project managing the whole project. So, <clears throat> just an uh, introduction, introduction on WH Davis. So, the, the site. If we get a new project, first question we have to ask ourselves if we can build it. So Langworth Junction, which is a site one at the moment, that you can see now on your screen, was originally a large steam depot uh, closed in the 1960s, and that determined the current footprint of WH Davis today. So to the bottom right, we have a press shop, 
um, has presses in it and class to small sub-assembly fabrication. Um, the Belfast shop to the right, so-called, because it used to have an old Belfast-style roof on it from the aircraft hangars. Um, we use that for sub-assemblies and container work. It used to have a Belfast roof on it. We have recently replaced it and we've raised the roof to give us additional height capacity, which potentially will put cranes in and that will allow wagons to go into that workshop as well. The engineering shop, the top shop, this is our main shop where the majority of wagon builds will happen. The old wagon shop that you see at the bottom, um, that's mainly for spraying and shot blasting in this day. The new wagon shop, um, it's linked to the sidings and any wagons will be finished off down there, but we also put production lines in there as well for a single wagon build. And then next to that, we have a lean-to, which is normally used for final finish of wagons only. So we'll talk through build stage now. So I'll use the outer vehicle as an example because the inner wagon on a triple, it's the same as the outer wagon in respect that the inner end of the outer wagon, if you mirror it, you get an inner wagon. So it's very similar. All our wagons are jig built. So as you can see in the top right hand corner, that is the underframe subassemblies. The subassemblies being the outer headstock, the spine, the outriggers, the brake control unit bracket, and the inner end headstock. They will come together and they'll be positioned in the jig um, using stops to locate them. And <clears throat> what this means is we can get precision component, component placement and it's repeatable. So we build the first one to set the jig, we set all the stops, and then after that, every wagon afterwards should be identical. So some of our welding processes briefly, um, we use pulse welding processes. Um, we also have a submerged arc. If you look at the top left hand picture of the wagon, the spine that you see, um, we use a submerged arc for them. It has advantages that you'll get a strong quality weld um, and the consistent. You get minimal welding fume emitted from them. Minimal arc light is emitted and thick materials can be welded. On the spine, you can see there, the plate was up to 30 mil thick. Um, so there's some chunky sections being welded together. The other advantage is you get high deposition rate, which means less passes and less distortion. So <clears throat> once the sub-assemblers are tacked together, if you look at the bottom right picture, it will go into the turning rings. Um, wagons position, position centrally in the rings about its center of gravity so it can rotate freely. And the advantage of this under frame being in the turning rings is all the welds are done in a downhand position. This will make it easier for the welder, so it's the natural gravity is working with the weld. And also in terms of weld procedures, it reduces the amount that they required. All right, so once the under frames welded together, it will go into paint finish first. So on our site, we have a section blaster. Um, which can blast plate sections prior to subassembly or to loose component. Um, so it's for piece parts. And we have two shop blast booths for wagons or containers. Um, and what we do there is we produce the SA two and a half surface preparation ready for the wagons to be painted. In the top left, you can see our wagon spray booth. The wagons will go in there to be primed and then top coated. Once the wagon's painted, it's ready for its next stage. So the next stage is the fitment of the brake equipment. So the brake system is a standard automatic continuous air brake system. Um, it works in a drop in brake pipe pressure, results in the application of the brakes. It's standard UIC brake equipment supplied by DACO. You will have a compact brake unit, um, which is a distributor and relays combine 
We've got the auxiliary reservoir, we have no Brent's displacement valves, and we have a handbrake interlock on the handbrake bogey. All the pipe work that you can see is thin gauge stainless steel, and we form that in house. When we fit the brake pipe work in the same bay, we'll apply the decals. So once the brake pipe work's fitted, it's decaled, it's painted, it will then go into its final fit. So the final items we'll have to fit is the buckle and draw gears. That'll be the next items to go. We would then mount the, mount the wagon on its bogies, and then it would be any ancillary items. So an example on this wagon, we fit a VTG Connect, which is a tracking device. We fit decal boards, we have an RFID tag, and there's a label holder. Once that's all fit, the wagon will undergo um, its final quality control checks for buffer heights, deck height, and gauging. It will then be brake tested, and then it has a final inspection. <clears throat> so as mentioned before, if we get a project, the first question we ask is, do we have the class to build, to build it? So when the Correct 2 project was planned, we had to look at the projects that we had running concurrently. On the left-hand side, you can see HYAB wagon. So they come into us onto our sidings as a three-door hopper wagon. So we have to have space in our sidings to take them in. They go into our factory through the repurposing process and they come out, as you can see on the left-hand side for one customer fully finished. The other project we were running um, at the same time is in the middle and that is a JNA Megabox wagon. We call it a mega box because it's got 75 meter cube capacity. So over a typical 60 meter cube, it's 1.5 meters longer to get the additional volume. So it is quite a large wagon and it's sub assemblies and itself take up a good size footprint. And then finally on the end, the BTG Ecofrets 2s, which will be going through at the same time as them both. So, what we have to do then, as part of considering this, is set out our workshop. This is the what we call the top shop, but the main build wagon workshop. And within this, two wagons would be getting built. So we would have the JNA, which is the 75 meter cube mega box, and the Ecofret wagons. So we will take our, have our sub assemblies come into this factory and on the bottom left, you can see eco assembly. That's where we will put the sub, sub assemblies together and the jig and tack them together. It will then go on to eco first stage weld. So we weld it a little bit more than tacking to make sure that it can hold itself when it goes into the rollover wings, which is the eco main weld. And then we'll go into it in a bit more detail in a bit, but we have an equal eco final weld station. From there, it will go into the paint booth and then it will go into eco fit out where we decal it and fit the brake equipment. So with the two wagon jobs in there, you can see that factory was at full capacity. Next. The um, majority of this workshop was allocated for the HYAB repurposing. Um, this is the workshop that is connected to our side ends. So the final finish of all wagons is done down here. So we can take it straight out to in, onto our side ends, ready to be accepted by a customer VTG and then onto the main line. So, WH Davis were responsible for the wagon body design work, including structures and the brake system. So what I want to do is just take one area of that and talk through um, as an example that you might find interesting. And we can follow it through from design, look at some of the constraints issues we had through to production. So the wagon design, as mentioned previously, was based upon the threat one. Um, with the additions as mentioned. So 
the new TF20 bogey, because of the type, it changed how the wagon was supported. So if you look at the yellow ring on your screen, that's the secondary suspension and the load goes through there. So when we came to design the bolster arrangement, we had to totally redesign it because the bogey connections are different. Our wagon has brackets mounted to the underframe where traditionally it would be a um, fitment attached to the bogey that's just bolted to the underframe. And we had constraints to work with them. So we had a maximum 996 millimeter deck height. And this was due to the gauging requirements because we sit a container on top of the deck and it cannot exceed gauge. The other constraint we had was, if you look at the picture on the right-hand side of the bogey section, to the top of the secondary suspension with the upper tolerance of plus 10 millimeters, that dimension could be 768 millimeters. Um, the plus 10 millimeters due to variation in the primary suspension springs and a small contribution to the secondary suspension, which is the black chevron rubber stack. You can see just below the round yellow circle. So if you take the deck height and minus the worst case secondary suspension height, this will leave a 228 millimeter envelope to fit the bolster in. So drawing your attention again to the area circle yellow, we would traditionally, as a manufacturer, have 15 mil, approximately, daylight clearance between the top of the secondary suspension and the underside of the bolster. Um, this would help us to pack the wagon to get the decks level and to mitigate against fill tolerance within the wagon and the bogey. So if you look at the green square, there is another constraint and this is constraining in the underside of the spine. So if you look within the bolster of the wagon, there is a bogey cross tie. Because the deck is only connected to the wagon through dampers and it sits on spigots on the secondary suspension, if the deck was raised, it would pull the bogey up at its dampers, um, which couldn't happen. So we've connected a hanger to the underside of the wagon. So if the wagon's raised, the cross tie that you can see at the bottom of the green square will contact on the inside face of the top plate of the bolster and allow the wagon to be lifted. So that clear daylight area, we had a clearance of 25 millimeters plus or minus 10 millimeters. The upper tolerance was to ensure the second suspension spigots, they're the spigots that you can see sticking through the plate in the wagon, did not disengage from the wagon frame when the wagon body was lifted. The lower tolerance was to ensure the cross plate did not impact the bolster due to dynamic movements when it's on the track. So, we ended up with a packing gap of eight millimeters, which is more, less than would normally like. Um, this was due um, in part to the stresses in the transition. So within that red rectangle, you can see a joggle where the underside of the wagon, which is represented as the green line, transitions to where the bolster will contact on the side bearer, which is the yellow line. So we had a 42 mil, transition to make from the bottom of the spine to the bolster. Um, the wagon is supported on the second suspension. So pair wagon, there's four low transfer areas, which works out approximately 15 tonne of load going through them. Um, when we're designing it, we have considerations. Um, fatigue is a key one. Um, usually on a wagon design, if the wagon will fail its structural analysis, it'll be fatigue. So we was, had to have a fatigue, fatigue damage of less than one in the parent metal and the welds um, to ensure compliance with the structural standards. The other thing as well, when you look at that bottom plate, it's a 15 mil bottom plate, 
it had to be manufacturable. So you had to physically be able to press it. Um, and there are rules associated with pressing plates based on the thickness and the radiuses that you can achieve, achieve, but it's also about repeatability as well, because we need it accurate. So if you look at the FE picture on the right, after multiple iterations, and it was multiple iterations, a design was found which achieved compliance and could be manufactured. The high stressors, they were pushed out and flowing through to the spine bottom plate in the pair of metal. And you can see in the FE there, the stress distribution and the fact that that area is the highest stressed area of the wagon, which because that's where the load is transferred through to the bogey. So just following this through then, it's had ramifications um, on the build. As I said, mentioned earlier, um, traditionally we had 15 mil of packing, um, but was down to eight. So this also meant that we had a tight tolerance on the deck height of 991 millimeters plus or minus five. One of the problems comes from the welding of the final lateral joints. And you can see them pointed out on this picture by the red arrows. So if we use the top one as an example, if you were to weld the wagon there, um, as the weld pulls, the steel contracts and that will naturally pull the end of the wagon up. And over that distance where the spigots are for the container, that can result in a noticeable raising of the deck and potentially it would make it out of gauge. Within other industries, um, freight is different. Um, I've seen jigs that have been built to hold work pieces where there'll be a pneumatic clamp. Um, we had to work within the financial restrictions of the project and having a clamping jig, um, it wouldn't have been viable. So we need a cost. So we needed a cost-effective, pragmatic solution. So what we do is, as you can see in the right-hand picture, we put weights on the end of the wagon. So in that picture, there's four ton on the end of that wagon, which will cause, which is supported by jacks. We weld it. We allow it to pull for a period of time and the weights have held it in place and the deck will remain flat. All the decks we've built today, they have been within five mil of each other at the spigot points, which for 12 ton of steel over that length and the amount of heat going into it in the welding is a good achievement. Okay, so the next bit I want to talk about um, is the project compliance approach. So <clears throat> the top level is was TSIs at the time, because at that point um, we're still in Europe, so we was working with TSIs. So the Railways Interoperability Regulation 2011 um, require compliance to all applicable TSIs as they were at the time. They are now known as NTSNs. So within that standard, to comply to the TSI, it also requires compliance to standards that are referenced directly. Um, and these can be EN standards or could be other NTS, TSIs. Additionally, we have NNTRs. So RIR requires compliance to all applicable Notified, notified national technical rules. Um, and these are intended to apply where there's specific cases. So if it's something that's specific to the UK or and it's an open point in the TSI, or it's to allow technical compatibility with the GB infrastructure. <clears throat> the next one we have um, is license conditions. So the OOR, in exercise of the powers conferred by 
Section 8 of the Railways Act 1993, they grant train licences. So when they grant a train licence, um, you can see train licences on the OIR's website for the different freight companies. There is a standard bit of text in it, and it's part three, condition nine, safety and standards. And what that states is the license holder shall comply with such railway group standards that are applicable to its licensed activities. And it's the same again, the rail industry standards or parts thereof. So the approach taken by the project team was any railway group standards or rail industry standards whereby compliance could be met at the design manufacture stage. Um, we ensured, or well, the project team ensured that all those clauses were met and they were classed as license conditions. The next level down for standards was voluntary standards. And this is just good practice in the absence of any mandated standards or license conditions. And they could come from railway group standards or RISAs that are found on the RSSB's website, EN standards, or even UIC standards, um, which in the case of this wagon is applicable because there currently isn't a EN or UK standard about spigot positions and tolerances and dimensions, but there is one for UIC. So, <clears throat> applicable standards. So, as mentioned earlier, there were three changes um, to the EcoFret One wagons. The EcoFret One wagons were type approved, and traditionally, um, on some projects at WH Davis, if we have a wagon based on another wagon, um, we can class it as an upgrade or renewal. So, you would then look at what's changing, um, determine is it the same or better than the standard at the time? If it is, you can prove compliance that way. From those three changes that happened, all the standards you see in front of you, and I've split them down into systems, every single one of those standards had to be reassessed as a result of those three changes. So the bogey was a prototype bogey. So if you look at the bogey section and the ride section, they all had to be reassessed. The gauging, which is under the compatibility header, the bogies had an increased lateral movement. So again, the gauging had to be assessed because the dynamic movements were different to the previous wagon. Braking, there was a new braking system, so all the stopping distance calculations had to be assessed again and all the other requirements that surround the brake system. Earth bonding, there was a new wagon. We had to reassess it against the latest standards. And that was the theme throughout all the different standards that were involved in this project. And there's 49 there, and I believe there was more, and I might have missed some. So, WH Davis, um, part of our contract, we were building a prototype work and in line with axiom building prototype bogies. So once the prototype vehicle was built, um, it then had to go for testing. So we got the approvals up to the point of an ISV, an intermediate statement of verification. So we proved the structures were sound, the braking system was as sound as it could be in terms of calculations, so it was waiting verification. The ride had been modeled using software called Vampire, um, but both the ride and the break-in needed verification by on-track testing. So all the other standards, fire, et cetera, were proof compliance. The wagon then went out for on-track testing, um, went out for its ride trial test around the Derby area, it had to be on represent representative track, so it had to go over different track configurations so you can make the argument, yep, it's been on track, all over track of a certain length that's representative to the UK network. The stopping distance test, um, a bit different. They want as straight and level track as you could get. Um, and then was reducing speeds and seeing what the stopping distances were. Once we'd been through that process, that's when the project had approval to place in service from the ORR. Um, 
WH Davis were engaging in serial production straight after the prototype build. So it was more like a first off build rather than a prototype. Um, we had a contract to build 84 triple wagons and we are currently in the final batch of 20 in production now. So that's me at the end. A um, few minutes quicker than planned. Has anybody got any questions that we would use my screen? Let me look. Well done, Carl. <clears throat> well, thank you, everyone, well Carl, and thank you for everybody who's been. Any questions in the chat so far? So we have got time for a Q&A. Um, if people would like to either ask a question in person, then you'll need to turn your cameras back on uh, and unmute yourselves as well. Um, so that people, we can all see you. Um, I have to just remind you on the sort of on the GDPR front, if you don't wish to be recorded, then you know, I'm afraid you'll have to keep quiet um, or persuade somebody else to do your question for you. But otherwise, if you're happy to, to see your name coming up, then um, please continue. But I would invite you to, to come on video, um, even if you're not going to ask a question, um, then it's a much more interactive experience for everybody concerned. So uh, I can see there's a couple of questions in the chat. So to get whilst you've all got your thinking caps on, I'll ask those questions that were uh, in the chat already. So I'll start with the one that's nearest to the bottom list from Roger Talent on the FEA. There are a lot of areas away from the bolsters, which are very low stress. Could some thinner plates have been used to achieve a weight saving? And I'll add a little rider to that. Would it have made much difference, Carl? In the area, it possibly wouldn't have made too much difference. Um, we had a, a senior design engineer doing the FEA, um, and a gentleman who's actually in the call verifying it. Um, and I know in that area, we did have problems getting the fatigue damage to less than one, and the result that you got was the end result. Um, sorry, I can't answer that any further, but it was a bit out of my area. Fair comment, and it, it is a specialist area. I'm, I'm definitely with you on it's, uh, it's one that very few of us would actually want to take on, I think. Yeah. And there's a second one from Roger also uh, secondary suspension rubbers. Do we think they have a service life and do they go hard over a period? Now this of they, course doesn't affect freight wagons. Thank you. Yeah, they do have a service life and I believe there's a mandatory period to replace them. I can't quote it. Um, and yeah, do they go hard over a period? I think the sunlight can affect them and at times the, there's metal plates bonded in between and that can shear and fail. Yeah, I think the um, where, where they sometimes fail is, is at the that interface between the, 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 the metal plate and, and the rubber yes. itself, where the bomb actually starts to fail. You're quite yeah. right. We had them, we have them rather on the time and we're metro cars, Chevron's, Chevron Springs, they're on yes. civil engineers plant too on tampers and things. Yeah. So, Maggie, Maggie Springs, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just, just to add to that, Louise, so on TF25s, right. the current, uh, uh, oh yeah, mate. So the current, uh, the current um, secondary suspension rubbers, they're they're in the I think in the manual for change at half a million miles, which is obviously worked out on a typical freight sort of vehicle at about every seven to eight years. But I know that a number of um, FOCs and leasing companies now are currently looking at extending that up to ten years based on on what they've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so, that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. I think we used to go seven years between replacement on time and we're metro. Coinciding with other things, principally not because the, the Chevron Springs were a problem. Jolly good. Right. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, question from Richard. Firstly, thank you for a great talk, Carl. Um, were the test runs on the new vehicles carried out with loaded containers, empties, or no containers? So on the ride, there was a mixture. Um, tire containers loaded containers but because of the suspension was a free stage you also had to test it at its worst point so it was a part laden as well 
for the brake testing, it was also tested at its, um, I'm trying to remember the weight in tons now. I think it might have been about 26 ton. Um, because on the bogey you've got three stage suspension, the displacement valve was only two stage. So in tear, we had a tear pressure of 1.25 bar. Now, because it was a three stage suspension, we had to get a linear displacement valve to match the three stages of the bogey. So for the, I believe it was in the initial five or six tons, we stuck with a tear pressure. So as you can imagine, uh, approximately 26 tons say, you've increased the load, but you've still got a tire pressure. So we had to check the stopping distance at that load of the tire pressure still. So there was multiple different weights of the vehicle tested in order to achieve full compliance. Hmm, more complicated than you might think. Jolly good. Right, so now I'm gonna look Around to see who switched their camera on, and if anybody would like to put their hand up and wave and ask a specific question. Louise, come on. Oh, can you hear me, Louise? Terry. Yes, we can. Derek, do you want to switch your camera on? Yes, please. I, I've tried that and it won't. You can, you can do that. Ah, one moment. We should. Uh, da, da, da. Right, has that helped? That's the right button. That should yeah. be. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. There we are. Okay. I have a question, please, if I may. Go ahead, yeah. Derek. My latter days working for the railway, as it were, was in passenger vehicles. And every vehicle that was turned out from the workshops was tested on the track before it was released to the customer. Is that the case with these wagons, please? Yes. Um... Through our quality control process, we have um, various different tests. So some of workstation specific. Um, on the series production for these wagons, we did a swing and ramp test. So on the bogey, we replicated the going around the curve, um, checking for any components fouling, the same as on a ramp. We also do brake testing of the vehicles. Um, we do continuity testing as well. So we're testing the airpons. And then there's the standard um, quality control checks that we do for the deck height, torque, tightening of fasteners, etc. Does that answer it, or was it? No. What I was thinking in terms of every set, as it were, every DMU set, EMU set was actually taken out onto the track and tested. Now, what I'm the question was really: Do you do that with every wagon? No, we don't. We do it for in the instance of the Eco Threat actually going out on the track. Um, it was just prototype testing. Yes, yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a different philosophical approach, Derek. Um, series production, make everything the same or within within the tolerances. No need to go out and test it again. Yeah. Simpler vehicles, to be fair, but still yeah. some complexities. Wow. So, um, to give you an, an example of the additional complexities, and forgive me for, for jumping in, Carl, but if you get that's a wagon fine. that's really very close to gauge, then uh, you, you'd pay it an awful lot more attention at the point of final assembly to see just how close to gauge it actually was. Yeah. So we had some hoppers, uh, the coal hoppers that are still running around uh, for pre ws when they were built at York. Mm. About 2001, 2002 were literally right on gauge and the build tolerances if we weren't careful could get it just the wrong side of good so we had a very very careful measuring of, of the, the vehicle to gauge at that point um, but all, all the rest of the tests were repeatable uh, and we even took the, the philosophical decision actually to verify the bogey and brake system for vehicles at 100 tons and not redo it because it was always transferable so there's a lot of type testing and, and subtypes as, as well below the, the principal type of vehicle. So um, that helped us a lot in terms of vehicle approval times and approval risk. So we set that up ahead, ahead before the factory was even constructed. We were doing that kind of thing. Good. Right. Sorry, Derek. Sorry. Derek, Derek, related to how these vehicles are paid for, as it were. Does the customer actually release the money to the manufacturer? right at the end 
for each vehicle? Or do, is there a state experiment situation? Um, that's, that's, um, that's a commercial discussion we can't have, Derek, I'm afraid. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Andy, I think you were going to ask a question. Uh, to expand the answer, Derek, when I uh, bought some vehicles off WH Davies, we, we, we did a customer um, handover uh, in, in a batch format. So it's very much as and when the sidings has got full and they, they need to clear the sidings out. They went and inspected a batch of eight or a batch of ten before they left. It, it, to be honest, Derek, it varies upon uh, different kind of customers have different different bits in their contract, but what we try to be is... I, I realise it's all down to the contract. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's just, we have to try to be very flexible with customers at the moment. Some some people don't want to pay anything up front, um, but there's obviously financial consequences for people and for companies for that. Um, mm -hmm. And other companies are quite happy to put a load of money up front, but it's really about having that discussion with the customer at the beginning. So, Indeed. So, quite so. I was basically working on a situation that was virtually the same contract. It all depended on what the product was that came up to the end. Very different, very different situation. Yes. Before everybody else came in, Carl and I were having a conversation about the, the differences that COVID made to, to the working practices. I think that's, that's probably worth having a quick run through again, Carl, the kinds of things that you've had to do to accommodate COVID, but still continue to, to produce your outputs? Yeah, when um, COVID started, uh, obviously we're manufacturing, uh, manufacturing freight wagons and our works kept going. So what we did in terms of the officers, anybody was vulnerable and we had a skeleton staff there, I was one of them. So I was in the office permanently, but in terms of the shop floor, we had to risk assess our working practices so we looked at the operations people were doing and looked at the human contact they came, they came into as a result of it. So, for example, you could have a job whereby it would normally be a two-person job. So we would look at that and think, right, is there any equipment we could get to make it a one-person job? Or do we need to put screens up? So we would risk assess the operations as they were doing them on the project um, to make it COVID secure. Hmm. I think there's um, one of the things things that people have found is actually they've they've actually got better than just carrying on the way they were, they used to be doing COVID. They've had to reassess things. And they've actually found better ways of doing it. Do you think any of that resulted into to your processes? Um, there's definitely improvements made, I'd imagine, that made people think differently. Um, obviously, the biggest change for COVID, which is probably the same for everybody here, um, is meetings and working through teams. So you're not always going to site for a meeting, which is safe travel, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, there were some, some cultural things that we had to sort out because, obviously, as Carl said, we had people... Um, that could work from home, you know, some vulnerable people and some designers, and we tried to keep that to a minimum. But at the same time, we've got, you know, 90 guys downstairs welding, fabricating, fitting equipment, and you have to take into account the fact that those guys see other people, it's human nature, they see other people working at home, and they're saying, well, why can't we work at home? Mm -hmm. And, well, you can't take, you can't take, 12 tonnes of material I'm into your garage and do it, can you? So, <laughs> I'm oh, sure yeah, there'll be so, somebody that might have yeah. a go. <laughs> no, that, so it, was, that was, it, was, it was key that people like Carl, myself, the MD and everybody, we were, we were, always, vis we were always in every day. We were visible. So the, the premise was, if we're here, then there's no mm. reason you shouldn't be here. So. Yeah, we, um, we didn't really have any outbreaks. Mm. We did with us and also the HSE came in and we were COVID secure. So yeah. we handled it really well. Yeah. Good. I'm very pleased to hear it. And may that continue as well. Okay. I was um I was interested to see the the sort of market appreciation you had, Cole. How do you maintain that level of understanding of, of what your customers are, are interested in, what makes a difference to them? 
Um, well, to be honest, this is more Les's side. <laughs> well, For people Les who don't know here, Les is the engineering director at WH Davis, so he's actually my boss. Um, and Les deals more with the commercial side and customers, don't you? Yeah, I'm just checking up on him. So. <laughs> 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 no, to, to, no, to be honest, it's 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 um when you've been, and I can see some familiar faces that have been around almost or as long as me. So the the freight industry, uh, and I, I don't say this disrespectfully, is a very incestuous incestuous part of the industry. Everybody mm -hmm. knows everybody, and everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And as much as you try to keep something a secret, it will creep out. It will mm -hmm. get out. And it is really just about those those connections within the industry, and 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 it's about knowing knowing who the key players are, who the who the people in those businesses are. And just keeping in contact with them, um, and then and then and then just yeah, trying to trying to put forward an, an offer um, to the customer that that ticks all their boxes. And usually the first the first tick has to be price. So that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no there's no point in advertising. I mean, I get lots of requests from companies. Do you want to advertise? Do you in the market? Yes, my boss says a little thing which he he, he drops into correspondence. <laughs> But, but the reality is, yeah. like I say, in the freight side, and it's very much the same in the past, everybody knows everybody, so you know who your customers are. And it's very yeah. rare, and, and the current <clears throat> box production that we're, we're building now is, is probably a very strange one in that we, we, a guy came to us out of the blue and just said, I want to own 30 box wagons. And, <laughs> and so, so, yeah, so we're going to build, we're building him, start building him 30 box wagons now. Um, but but Rao isn't his business, so he's not aware of things like what an ECM is or how maintenance is carried out or all those things. So we're doing that for him as well as part of part of what we're doing for him. So, mm -hmm. but most yeah. most of the time it's the leasing companies or the FOCs. But everybody knows everybody, and everybody yeah. goes to the IMEC lunch, drinks a little bit too much, and then tells everybody what's going on. <laughs> hmm. Can't Imagine that happening at all. <laughs> <laughs> it gets upon us of COVID at the same time. Well, thankfully, not many of us did. Um, and I think the only super spreader event was the chairman's reception, mm -hmm. somehow. <clears throat> I think it was to do with the amount of alcohol that you can see. Avoided that day, one. To be honest. <laughs> Neutralised it. <laughs> Surely not. Surely not. Oh, jolly good. Martin, Martin, yeah, thanks. yeah, thanks, Louise, and uh, thanks, Carl. A great presentation. Um, Thank you. I, I wonder if you could just uh, expand a bit on the challenges that you faced. You, you, you talked about the the bolster design and that sort of kink in the body, but, but sort of technically, were they the biggest challenges? If not, what, what were the biggest challenges? And then, what, what, thinking about the challenge, what, what was the biggest challenge to the overall program? The, the structures were a challenge because we set off um, on the premise of an eco threat one. But obviously, the changes involved had fundamental effects. Um, so we was taking a, an original structure with these different load positions. So we was trying to finesse it to get it to meet the requirements. Um, the braking calcs were complicated as well. Um, so it followed the full methodology required by the EM. Um, obviously, this is on the other side, but actually we're developing a prototype bogey and appreciate the challenges associated with that for container wagon particularly. Um, just trying to think what were our main challenges. I'd say it's, um, it was the structures internally uh, from a design perspective. Um, and then it was the bolster that caused but it didn't cause a problem, but it had to ensure that production were building the decks as flat as possible. And they did do a marvellous job of it. Um, as you can imagine, 12 tonne over that length, that much heat, to achieve what they achieved in terms of the levelness of the deck, um, using our traditional manufacturing methods was fantastic. So. Okay. And the timescale challenge, then the program challenges. What, what, what was the biggest thing there? Was it was it so? There was timescale challenges, and um, specifically with 
the prototype um, because at one point it was booked in for testing. So we had to try and um, reach those time scales. Um, then testing through in its own time scales as well because, the, sorry, its own issues because of the time of the year. Um, doing a break test at that time of year. I think one night it didn't start raining for 10 hours. Um, but yeah, and because it, I think because it was a prototype as well, um, it was done at risk. So you were going through the design and you've got your testing. There is risk there for anyone who's been involved in a prototype will appreciate. And you are up against tight time scales um, for the testing. So yeah, it was a lot of pressure as well. That was one of the challenges. Thanks. Yeah, and there was multiple people involved in the project. Um, I don't know what about you might know, but in a container wagon that's got a prototype bogey, the amount of approval work you have to do, the amount of gauging work you have to do, the ride, the bogey, the braking, it is a massive project. We had a um, gauging specialist, we had a braking specialist, obviously we did the structures internally, Wabtech were doing the ride, um, so it was a huge project, which is why Fishbone got involved as well, to pull it all together, the project management side. Yeah, well, obviously, we uh, at Aegis were involved in the certification. I mean, yes, yes. At, at our end, I thought that actually worked quite well, given that we've got so many parties involved. Um, yeah. that's, that's what we saw. Hopefully, you saw something similar as well. Yeah, um, and it was a very compliant wagon as well. In the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. It looks like a very good wagon, actually, from, from past experience of being a freight wagon customer and working with the commercial colleagues to, to provide them with what they want for their businesses it looks good to me very well yeah I'm not trying to squat not trying to you know we were trying to squeeze a quart into a pint pot but also introduce the maximum flexibility in, in your unit length and in your individual wagons with the fewest possible bogies and, and so on so yeah very very good all right so at a quarter to eight and we'll bar the shouting I think it's probably time for us to uh, draw proceedings to, to a close. Um, I've got a, a little bit of an advert to do for the next lecture in the Northeastern Centre, uh, which is our joint uh, ev event with the Northwestern Centre, which will be at the University of Huddersfield, uh, and also the opportunity to tour the robotics lab, which is just recently a retrospective looking at the pacer, which somebody once described as a, a bus on a coat on a wagon, or a bus on a wagon frame, I should say. How accurate that truly was remains to be seen, but I, I have little reason to doubt the remark, given its origin. So everybody be, would be very welcome to join us on the 10th of May in Huddersfield, it will be in person. If you're uncomfortable about COVID, please feel free to uh, pass on the trip, but I'm sure we'll be doing another joint lecture with uh, the Northwestern Centre next year as well. If <clears throat> you're frozen, Louise, Oh no, Andy, are you there? I am. I am. Oh, uh, you, you good. Froze, you it's only me that's there. dying. You, you froze there for uh, ten seconds or so, Louise. Oh, sorry. So, um, so yeah. So, so it falls upon me to to give a vote of thanks to to Carl. So, um, uh, yeah. Firstly, a wonderful presentation. You know, good, good mix of. Uh, Technical content and, and uh, capabilities that WH Davis you know, clearly demonstrate a high level of technical competence. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I first was introduced to WH Davis over 15 years ago um, as, as a client at that time. And, and um, yeah, I, I noticed that Carl has now said that these wagons were jig builds, which you know, it's a step forward because the wagons that I got built had a piece of piano wire stretched down the spine, and, and that was the datum. Um, and some uh, fish plates at each end of the piano wire keeping it taut. So 
Uh, so, so yeah, so uh, clearly um, moving forward, massive investment with the super, super, submerged arc welding processes. Which, uh, so, uh, so, yeah. And I, I did notice, um, uh, maybe for some of the younger members, if there's someone still left, younger members, I'm looking for this. Um, Cal mentioned SLUs. I quickly looked up some old spreadsheets and, uh, and remembered an SLU is, is 20 feet. It's an old British real measurements, similar to chains and furlongs and the like. So, uh, so, yeah. So, um, um, yeah, great presentation. Um, and I personally, I can't see how we as a country can get HDV lobbies to be battery or um, hydrogen powered. And I hope, you know, I sincerely hope for, for all of us here that, that um, it's got a, a brilliant future. Um, you know, I can't see you know, a, a renaissance, if you like. So, um, so I hope we're all part of that equation. So, uh, so, so uh, yeah, once again, thank you, Carl. Uh, great presentation. Um, and thank you to the H. Davis. And um, if we could thank uh, Carl in the usual way, please. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thanks, Carl. Well, it was an excellent insight, insight into building and designing of, of freight wagons, which I think is, is insufficiently appreciated sometimes, but, but definitely worthwhile. And we're very, very glad to have you. So thank you very much. So at this point, I would wish you uh, all a safe journey downstairs to your kitchen where you might find your fridge and something nice and chilled inside. I'm sure Carl's going to head that direction. Uh, otherwise... Well. Stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. We look forward to welcoming you on the 10th of May. If you do have any ideas of things you'd like to hear about, please do drop us a line. Use any of the contact mechanisms that are out there. We do run this program for you. It's not for our own um, boredom relief. It's, it's there for a good reason. And if you've got something you'd like to hear about, we might be able to facilitate it and share it with a wider audience as well. So take care, everybody. We'll see you in just over a month. And thank you very much for the pleasure of your company this evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, bye.